Our guest in this segment is Senator Joe Manchin. He joins us via telephone. Senator, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, Rob, you and Bill. And is John not with you today? John tweaked his back, so he had to stay home. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sure that you all will take over in grand style. Yeah, he's afraid of that. He thinks we'll be such grand style, <laughs> he'll, keep, he'll stay home. So, But he does a good oh, job. Bill, he's here. Yeah. yeah, you guys do a great job, and I appreciate it so much. Hey, hope uh, everything's good over in Eastern Panhandle, yeah. and I guess we're going to get a little bit of rain, some weather this uh, couple of next days. About time. Oh, Soon as before we get involved in what you want to talk about, I want to personally thank you that Bonnie and I had COVID a couple of weeks ago for the uh, uh, for the celebration, and you were kind enough to call us, and uh, that was that meant a lot to both of us. That was a very nice gesture on your part, so thank you so much. Well, Bill, let me just say on behalf of all of us in West Virginia and the Shepherd University community and everyone there and what you and Bonnie have done, the commitment you have in trying to build civility back to where it's supposed to be in this great uh, government of ours and, and the democracy and, and the freedoms that we enjoy. It's because we've been able to work through our differences, and now there's so little of that in the political arena, especially at the highest level, for you to have this institute and do what you're doing, and I, I can't tell you how much – I appreciate and also how much it had the plaque dedication um, in the uh, in the bird in the bird center and just everything you do. And I wanted to say this: uh, I know people heard about the little incident we had there. Those were not Shepherd students. Those were not West Virginia citizens. Those were a group of defiant people. They're called climate defiance. All they do is go around the country wherever I may be speaking, or other people that's basically. De- uh, promoting any type of a secured all of the above energy policy, which they don't want, just try to disrupt and, and uh, make a name for themselves. And that's who they are. So, Bill, that was no reflection on, on uh, Shepard, no reflection on you and Bonnie, and no reflection on our great state. These people are just defiant. That's defy. They defy everything. I've tried to sit down and talk to them. I've tried to ask them to come to my office. They won't do it. They won't. They want no type of uh, uh, conversation whatsoever, or just you know, basically whatever they can do to disrupt and uh, make it miserable for everyone who's in attendance. You know, since I and got the impression, well. I got the impression that set the stage very well. The protests set the stage for a night of civility. It showed stark contrast sure. between what they did and what you and Senator Capito and Hoppy and others did on the stage. Yeah, yeah. It was it was it was something to see Hoppy get fired up the way he did. That was good. I said, Hoppy, you're ready to rumble. Yeah. I said, Welcome to my world. I'm I'm just it was a good uh, evening. But going going back, uh, the, I thought the three of you were and and I and Ashley Horse deserves all the credit for setting this yeah. up and implementing. It. But I thought the three of you were the model of civility, uh, not only on the stage that night, but everything you do uh, is marked with civility. So I I want to publicly applaud you. Senator Capito and uh, and Hoppy for what you do in everyday life. Well, thanks, thanks, Bill. Uh, you recognizing that and basically the commitment that you and Bonnie have made towards making sure that other people understand it's better to work and talk through your differences than it is to basically curse the darkness. If you, it's uh, it's who we are. It's uh, West Virginia, but it's really our country. Putting country first. That's what it's really about. And I keep preaching that and i still believe bill as you believe i know in our generation uh public service is still the noblest of all profession and i found my footing i never had any idea i'd ever be in public service never had a desire to do it it just found me and it was something that just kind of clicked and i said man i enjoy helping people i watch my grandparents and my parents giving back in our little community and that was a way for me to give back and try to help make it better so every office that i ever was privileged enough and honored enough to serve and represent West Virginia. I thought it was a blessing to be able to go out and, uh, and tell the rest of the world who we are as West Virginians and we love each other and how we can agree to disagree, but we're still family and all the attributes of our great state and, and work through our differences and making sure that my purpose is to serve, not to be served. It's not self-service, it's public service, and I never, ever forgot that. And uh, I just appreciate more than you know you all recognizing that and willing to do what you're doing and the investments you're making in Shepherd to make sure it's continued on. And another point that I think you're so effective, uh, 
in your everyday life and also on the stage is that we as a state, we have a lot more similarities, a lot more in agreement than we do disagreement. Unfortunately, the disagreement's what gets all the press, but in reality, we have a lot more of that we agree on. Yeah, that's, it was, you know, as, as, human, as human beings, we're, we're creatures of nature. We want to belong. We want to work together. We have an inherent love of our family and all of our friends around us, and we expand that friendship and family just about anybody who wants to enter in. Uh, and that's just the way we are, and, and, and I'm thinking most Americans feel that way. We have the basic value of fr- family, and, and my grandmother only had three wishes that she always had. She come from Italy when she was a little girl, and then my grandmother came from Czechoslovakia. So they only had their commitment to to having this great opportunity in this wonderful country called the United States of America, he thought that everyone should have the ability and have access to having a, a roof over their head, clothes on their back, and food in their belly. That's all. One should have that. And that comes from basically an opportunity to work and provide and the dignity and what work does for you and the respect of work, being able to take yourself and your family. And it was pretty simple. And there was rules, always rules. And the rules were basically treat everyone else the way you want to be and give everyone else a helping hand. And that's what they did, and that's what I tried to emulate. But I don't know. It's just, it's just it's a shame that basically the extremes. You know, I tell people the simplest way, Bill, is this, and, and to Rob, the grand old party wants to be grand again. The Republican Party, the grand old party wants to be grand again. They truly were grand. And a Democratic Party wants to be responsible and be able to reach down in the bowels of human and, and make sure they have the stability and have the support to pick themselves up. That's who we inherently are. That's why we have parties. But the parties have got a business model now, which is basically both sides. Who can you hate the most? If you have an R by your name and you're identified as a Republican, you're supposed to hate everybody that has a D by their name. It's not an R. Or vice versa, as a D versus an R. That's not who we are. You know, I never looked at a Republican other than my friend. They might have a different idea, which I appreciate it, and somehow we'd work something out. It just doesn't, it's not that anymore. So that's why I became an independent. I just said the parties, uh, and I thought back about this, and I said, Bill, at the, at the meeting that night, um, uh, George Washington, our, our founding father, uh, basically said, as his first address in 1797, I believe, beware of the political parties, for they will usurp the power from the people. And that's what they're trying to do. And this is basically a government was the, 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 the framework of our government is for us to govern ourselves. Never been done before. Still an experiment age 240-some years later. But it's the premise of who we are. Can we govern ourselves? And that's what we're fighting to survive right now, making sure that we can get through these most turbulent times. Senator Joe Manchin, our guest here on the program. And uh, by the way, uh, Tara Mason asked us in our Facebook comment section to thank you for the recorded message that you sent to the Hope Dealer Project. And uh, the, the entire state goes purple during National Recovery Month and the West Virginia goes purple recovery yeah. uh, movement that they're, uh, she's fast that they're talking about there. So she says thank you. You know, it's just... Rob, please uh, thank her for for recognizing, but also for what they do every day. It's unbelievable. It's just unbelievable the challenges we have as a country. We're losing more Americans since in the last two decades, Rob and Bill, we have lost more Americans towards drug, either drug abuse, whether it be legal or illegal. More uh, uh, deaths in America in the last two uh, decades, 20 years than we have in every war that we have entered into to defend our great country since the Civil War. Every war, we have lost more in 20 years than we did in those 200-plus. Unbelievable. Or 150-plus, I'm sorry. Anyway, it's just unbelievable mm-hmm. what it's doing. We, this is a war, and I'm telling you, we should declare a war on drugs. I don't care where they're coming from. And this is, this is from the pharmaceutical companies that are putting out more and more opiates more pay, more uh, pharmaceutical, legal pharmaceutical drugs that just basically devastate people's lives and became very addictive. And then also the illicit drugs coming in all over. And a border that has to be secured 
And we all should be committed to making sure that we have immigration done the right way. Our uh, ancestors came to come here to, for a better life. We can do that. But you have to basically have a process that uh, far usurps the political posturing back and forth uh, to basically what we need. And we know we're going to need uh, more people wanting to come to this country for the right reason. They have to be vetted to make sure that they're safe and coming here for the right reason, being able then eventually to work like our grandparents did and bring their families with them to create a better quality of life and a better, stronger country because of the bonds that tie us together. And I don't know. We just got to get our act together. If we you, really do. I want to ask you to comment on uh, yet another assassination attempt on sure. former President Donald Trump. Yesterday, the Secret Service uh, responded quickly to the sight of a uh, rifle on the golf course and ultimately with the help of a citizen who snapped a photo of the person and their vehicle escaping, they were able to capture the suspect. Well, first of all, I'm just so thankful that he's okay. Anybody in political life that is going to be threatened and be afraid of because they might uh, be harmed and even assassinated. Uh, that's that's not the country that we have. I mean, I can remember as a 16-year-old John Kennedy getting assassinated. I couldn't believe. I just couldn't believe in the country. And this is way back in 1963 that we could lose the leader of the free world into a barbaric assassination. And here it is today, still achieving this, or trying to achieve that same type of notoriety, whoever it be it, these uh, uh, unbelievable people who are deranged. And I just believe we're going to have to go back, and I would hope that it will be very clear in a bipartisan way that we will have amount of uh, appropriated money that we're going to appropriate towards protecting our, uh, our uh, candidates. They need to be protected. They cannot be living in fear, being afraid to speak out, being afraid to, to campaign. That's not who we are, and we've got to make sure they have the resources to be protected. We have such a— a, a gun prevalent society, it seems like it would be almost impossible to protect a person around the clock. Rob, let, let, me, just, let me say about guns. I mean, this is the thing. It's a West Virginia. You know, sometimes we may just out of it, but I said, you know, in West Virginia, we're a gun-oriented state uh, because of just the natural uh, nature of our and, and our culture, culture. There's a lot of hunting, a lot of sports shooting. We have that, uh, that inherent into us. And I have said this, everybody talking about banning weapons, uh, that's the wrong approach. You, you can't deny me the right to buy what I want to buy. But what we can do is hold the uh, manufacturers more responsible for the lethality of the lethal, uh, of the weapons they're putting out. And also what we can do is making sure that people that want these weapons beyond those of us who go hunting and go sports shooting, but whether it be uh, the AR-15s or whatever, have the ability and have the uh, stature in order to be able to own one in a responsible manner. You know, I've said 1934, the Firearms Act of 1934, Rob. You, know, you can still buy a machine gun. You're going to pay a hefty price for it. You're going to pay a hefty fee for having it. You're going to have to show you're capable um, both mentally and physically in order to operate it. So if you have weapons that you don't want sold and you say you're going to ban them for ever making them if that's not attainable then can't you just say that the person should show the aptitude and the ability to uh, to own this weapon in a responsible way and use it in a way it's meant to be used in a responsible way whether it's a collector or whether it's someone who's a sports a sportsman i just think there's other ways to approach it but man when you start telling me uh, i can't have this and can't have that i'll never forget they were trying to do the same thing in Washington one day, and I was on the Senate floor, and I'm one of the senators. And I said, Senator, I think we ought to outlaw your car. And she said, what, my car? I says, I looked at that fancy car you had, had 140 on a speedometer. Said, you shouldn't have that. She looked at me, and I said, listen, I said, you have rules and regulations. You have to show that you're capable of handling that car and driving that car and a license. You take a test. Maybe we should do the same with some of these weapons that you think that should be outlawed before you outlaw them. Just a different way of thinking, though, mm -hmm. that's all. The 
need for another continuing resolution is uh, rapidly approaching. And uh, yeah. will we ever actually get a budget out of Congress, or we're we just going to keep functioning on continuing resolutions? Well, let me. You know, it's it's been more than twenty years since we passed a budget on time, and we haven't had a budget at all, even as late one, since twenty sixteen. How, how can you operate like that? Mitt Romney and I continuously try to. Excuse me. Introduce pieces of legislation that calls for fiscal responsibility, just a resp fiscal responsibility act, living within your means, having a stress test, which is the same as what every bank does and every business should be doing. You have the ability to wish any type of an emergency, and you have the monetary capability of doing so. These are things that you should be asking yourself. And the Treasury, we're not doing any of that in response, of, and no one. $35.4 trillion of debt. Every citizen in America, man, woman, and child, has is carrying a responsibility of $140,000 of federal debt, beyond what they're trying to live their life with if everyone responsible for it. But that's, a, that's unimaginable. And when you think this year will be the first year for, oh, my goodness, this will be the next couple of years when we're going to exceed uh, the debt-to-GDP ratio. We didn't do that since World War II, and we're trying to save the world uh, from fascism. This has all been self-inflicted, and no one's talking about it, not either side, Republican or Democrat, Trump, not Biden, not Kamala Harris. No one's talking about the debt of the nation and how we get our fi uh, financial house in order. And, and that will be the downfall of our country if we don't do it. Yeah, an extension of that, uh, Senator, and the fact that you will, are not running for re-election. Uh, how do you address the third rail of politics, the entitlements, uh, which will have to be addressed some way, but everybody's afraid to approach it? Well, when they talk about entitlements, what they're talking about, every time you talk about we're going to get our financial house in order, oh, well, they're going to cut Social Security and Medicare. God, that's the lifeline to over 60 percent of West Virginians. So how, you better be talking about how can I save Social Security and Medicare. And, you know, the first thing you can do is take the cap off. I mean, right now, West Virginians pay about 100 percent of that tax, the FICA tax from your from pay, uh, paychecks. Uh, and I think it's 164000 now. And after you make more than 164000 that's that tax stops. That okay, collection stops on, on Social Security and Medicare. Well, in West Virginia, you know, there's not a I think we may have lost Senator Manchin's phone line. It sounded like it was kind of cutting in and out yeah. on occasion during the conversation. That seems like it's completely gone now. So, Senator Manchin, if you're able to hear us still, I, I'm still, I'm back. I'm back, Rob. I'm sorry. Oh, there you Bill, are. You there? Yes, we are. Yes. Yeah, I don't know what happens. I'm. I'm <laughs> I'll try it again. The tax that we're paying right now, basically, we that uh, our employers and employees both pay is our FICA, federal insurance, and all that. Okay, Social Security, and Medicare, it stops at 164,000. Not many West Virginians make more than 164. So I have argued. I said, you know, in West Virginia, we're paying 100 percent of the tax. You might be in Connecticut uh, or uh, uh, one of the more wealthier states, and only maybe 30 or 40 percent of people because of their higher income average is more than that. There has to be adjustments there so there's more cash flow coming into it. And then you have to basically start making sure that we're not just throwing the money away for people that have not paid into the system. You know, we've added so much to those. So there's ways to recalibrate, but making sure that the people that have worked and paid Social Security, the people that are of age have Medicare to count on in their elderly in their elderly years. Those are things that I'm most concerned about that if we don't do something, then I might have a member of my family who's relying on a thousand dollar check a month, and maybe next year they get eight hundred versus a thousand. They don't know what happened. It's because we've been deficient in the amount of money that we have to run the system, and that'll happen automatically. So, yes, you do need to review every process we have, every entitlement, our trust funds, Bill, all the trust funds, whether it's a highway trust, Medicare, Social Security, all of them are in jeopardy of being basically cash strapped and defunct. You know, and when that happens, there's gonna be cuts made. Think about this one here, Bill. The highway trust fund. 
how are we going to maintain our highway system when we're promoting this this administration is promoting electrical cars electrical vehicles and they're not paying any fees or taxes to the road system when you bought a gallon of fuel before i think 18 cents went right to the federal government to maintain the federal highway system we haven't made any type of adjustment for that and no one's talking about these things it's just unbelievable yeah how will we address these? These are, again, I used the term third rail of politics earlier because there's something, yeah. they're, they're naughty problems and nobody really wants to take on the political ramifications. But these issues need to be looked at, either yeah. individual or in total. Well, the, the thing that we have, we have a bill we've introduced, myself, Mitt Romney. We have five Democrats and five Republicans. It's totally bipartisan. It's called the Fiscal Responsibility Act. We have to report the, the, the health and well-being of our fiscal state, basically where our finances are for our country, on an annual basis from the Treasury and every department on down. And unless you see where the challenges and problems are, you've talked about entitlements. We have mandatory spending and discretionary spending. Mandatory spending has continually absolutely grown. That means things you've got to spend for. Well, we know that we're going to spend on our social services of Social Security and Medicare, but senators and congresspeople alike have added more things, more cocktails, if you will. You've got to keep spending for this, and you've got to keep spending for that. Don't you think we should reevaluate where we are as a country, as a government, how we spend, and protect the basically uh, the, the basis of, uh, of, of uh, society such as uh, Medicare and Social Security, take that off of the table and make sure you're running it more efficiently. Make sure the people that have paid into it are getting it and the people that have been disabled are getting the support. But if a young person gets total disability at 40 years of age, maybe every three years they should be reexamined to see if they can do some partial work. No one's talking about any of these things that are sensible and reasonable. Senator Manchin, I want to thank you very much for your time today. As always, we much appreciate the conversation. Oh, sure thing, Rob. And, and Bill, thanks again, buddy, for just knowing and tell Bonnie we appreciate so much. Just keep up all the good work. That's all I can say. You all have been great. And, Rob, thank you for delivering the facts as they are. Well, I appreciate that. We, uh, as always, try to always cover both sides of a story and that's one of the things that has made this well, show unique there's, over there's, the years. There's three sides there's three sides to every every <laughs> uh, every challenge. There's your side, my side, and in between there has to be the right side <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> thank you, Senator, very much. Sir. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great Take day. Bye bye. Senator Joe Manchin at uh, nine thirty one.